Budeni. How do you do, Boris Mikhailovich? The Second Cavalry Corps is the only element of the commander of the Southern Front on the Dnipropetrovsk Kharkov sector. As you know, the enemy has persistently attempted to win operational space. It is also known that there is only one 273rd Rifle Division on the 60 km Perevolochnaya Dnipropetrovsk sector. Finally, the enemy is enveloping the right flank of the southwestern front from the north. If we transfer the Second Corps to that area, why should it be given to Yeremenko? I think the same thing will happen with that corps as had happened with the 21st Army. I would like to draw your attention in general to the actions of Yeremenko, who should have destroyed that enemy group. But actually, nothing of the sort happened. If you have a precise idea of what is happening on the southwestern and southern fronts, and, despite the fact that neither of them has any reserves, have decided to move the corps and transfer it to the Bryansk front, I will be forced to order the corps to move. Permit me to give a short summary of the situation. The Southwestern Front The 4th Rifle Division of the 5th Army is encircled near Chernigov. The enemy has forced the Desna River in areas east of Chernigov and on the Okunino sector. The enemy has forced the Dnieper at Kremenchug and southeast of the city. You know about the very right wing of the Southwestern Front. Kiponos has no reserves. Southern Front As I have already reported, heavy fighting is underway since August 25th on our bank at Dnipropetrovsk. Things are becoming more complicated in the Kakovka area. The enemy has committed no less than three divisions, and we have no solid front there. Shaposhnikov I understand all that, Semyon Mikhailovich, but for the southwestern front to fight, it is necessary to close the breach on the novgorod siversky konotop sector. That is the aim of the Second Cavalry Corps movement. The Supreme Commander-in-Chief has made Yeremenko responsible for the operation. I request that you move the corps to Putivil without delay. Budeni. All right. I have already summoned the Chief of Staff of the Southern Front to the telephone, and he will now receive the order to move the Cavalry Corps. Please report my opinion to the Supreme Commander-in-Chief, in particular on the actions of the Bryansk Front. Goodbye. Shaposhnikov. I will report your opinion by all means. Best wishes. Much time has passed since then, but I still cannot think of these events without being agitated. I believe that the Supreme Commander-in-Chief was mistaken when he demanded that the command of the Southwestern Front hold the defence line west of the Dnieper and west of Kiev to the last possibility. I have said above what had happened. There is no denying the fact that even the thought that Kiev might be lost was painful for every Soviet person. But in deciding the fate of the Ukraine's capital, all military and political factors should have been taken into account. War is war, and if it is necessary, if a large army group is threatened with encirclement and destruction, it must be rapidly withdrawn from under enemy blows to avoid serious defeat and unnecessary losses. When I touch upon the events at Yelnya, I invariably recall my personal feelings in those difficult days. The Yelnya operation was my first independent operation, my first test of operational strategic abilities in the big war against Nazi Germany. It is therefore understandable with what concern, particular care and attention I set about organising and implementing it. Soon, a Supreme Command directive arrived at the front. The second point said, Continuing to consolidate with its main forces the defence zone along the ostashkov selisharovo olenino the Dnieper river west of vyazma spas demensk kirov line The troops of the Reserve Front will launch an offensive with the left flank 24th and 43rd Armies on August 30th with the aim of defeating the Yelnya enemy group, capturing Yelnya and further attacking towards Pochinki and Roslavl to come out on the dolgi nivy kislavsky petrovici line on September 8, 1941. The Supreme Command's orders conformed to our proposals presented in Moscow. Since the enemy front had the shape of a large arc bulging in our direction, the idea of cutting it at the base with simultaneous strikes converging on a point west of Yelnya suggested itself. We also knew that the main forces of Guderian's 2nd Panzer Group had already moved south, while there were no large mobile reserves in the depth of the German defence. 
we instructed the troops to apply pressure on a number of other sectors along the entire Yelnia salient with secondary forces to prevent the Nazi command from concentrating efforts on the decisive sectors. At dawn on August 30th, following a short artillery attack, the troops of the Reserve Front launched a resolute offensive. The main blow was delivered by the 24th Army, commanded by Major General K.I. Rakutin. Its units were advancing on Yelnia from the northeast. Several elements of the 43rd Army were advancing from the southeast towards them. In those days when the Yelnia operation was unfolding, the enemy had turned the main forces of Guderian's 2nd Panzer Group towards Konotop, as we had expected. The Nazi command began to carry out its plan to surround and destroy our Kiev army group. That was why now it was particularly important for the Nazi command not to allow the defence at Yelnia to be breached and the reserve front to come out on the flank and in the rear of army group centre. The fighting on all the sectors of the front was desperate and heavy on both sides. The enemy confronted our advancing divisions with well-organised dense artillery and mortar fire. On our part, we also committed all the available aircraft, tanks, artillery and rocket launchers, making use of all kinds of military hardware, combining fire with skillful manoeuvring, our rifle units, artillery, pilots and tankmen acting in close cooperation delivered strong blows at the enemy, giving the Nazis no respite by day or by night. The German 10th Panzer, 17th Motorized and 15th Infantry Divisions were routed. The Nazi command pinned great hopes on the SS Reich Motorized Division, which had been hastily transferred to Yelnia, and included picked regiments from Germany, Führer and Elf. Many leaflets of the Nazi command were found in the zone of that division's defence. The leaflets praised the valour of Nazi soldiers and expressed certainty that they would win victories in the future too. However, Hitler's hopes were not to be realised. As with the other German units on the salient, the SS division suffered irretrievable losses as a result of shattering blows by our units. On September 1st, 1941, I was summoned to the telegraph apparatus by Poskrebyshev. General of the Army Zhukov is on the line. Poskrebyshev is on the line. Leave for Moscow directly. If there is any possibility to do so, set out transferring your duties to Rakutin or Bogdanov for the time of your absence. Zhukov. I have just received unfavourable reports about the 211th Division, which had been operating in the Roslavl area. The division has retired five, six kilometres, thus creating a disadvantageous situation for the 149th Rifle Division. In view of the complicated situation, I would like to travel to the zone of the 211th Division at night and restore order there. For that reason, I would request, if possible, to have my arrival put off, if not, I will set out immediately. Things are developing quite well at Yelnia. We have reached the Yelnia-Smolensk railway. If I am ordered to leave, I will leave Bogdanov as deputy and order him to pass the command of the group on the Roslavl sector to Sobenikov. I await Comrade Stalin's orders. Stalin. How do you do, Comrade Zhukov? In this case, put off your trip to Moscow and travel to the front lines. How do you do, Comrade Stalin? Should I still be ready to go to the general headquarters in a couple of days, or can I work according to my plan? Stalin. You can work according to your plan, Dot Zhukov. Fine. Best wishes. Meanwhile, the enemy refused to yield, and stubbornly held on to every height and every favourable line. The enemy command committed the fresh 157th, 178th, 268th, and 292nd infantry divisions to battle but even these considerable reinforcements failed to break the attacking spirit of the Soviet troops. Our units did not permit the enemy to dig in. They enveloped him from the flanks and cut off escape routes. The bottleneck of the Yelnia salient was increasingly narrowed by steel pincers. Soviet men, commanders and political workers showed models of military valour in fierce fighting with the Nazis. The 100th Rifle Division, commanded by Major General in Rusyanov, displayed daring, courage and efficient organisation. The division was assigned the mission of breaching the enemy defence on a six-kilometre sector by means of a strike from the north, smashing the enemy units facing it and cutting off escape routes for the enemy group from the Yelnia area westward. I knew General Rusyanov very well 
In 1933 we had worked together in the Slutsk garrison in Byelorussia. He had commanded a rifle regiment then. He was a very capable commander, and his regiment had always been among the best. The 100th Division prepared for the offensive from August 22nd to 29. Reconnaissance of the enemy and the terrain was organised in the zone of the coming operations. On August 23rd, General Rusyanov carried out a reconnaissance mission with regiment, battalion and company commanders. All questions pertaining to the specification of the combat missions and the organisation of cooperation between infantry and artillery were elaborated. Political work aimed at fulfilling the combat mission was carried on continuously in the units before the beginning of the offensive and during the fighting. During the preparations, I repeatedly visited the units and was quite certain that we would succeed. In the morning of August 30th, the 100th Division launched the offensive together with other units of the 24th Army. The enemy resisted desperately. The 85th Rifle Regiment was most successful, breaching the enemy defence during a night battle. To achieve success on the main sector on the night before September 3rd, the division commander transferred to this regiment's zone all the elements of the adjacent 335th Rifle Regiment on the left. Having overcome stubborn enemy resistance, at the end of September 5th, units of the 100th Division drove a deep wedge into the enemy defences and reached the rear routes of the enemy group, thereby helping other formations of the army to gain possession of the city. The 100th Rifle Division was renamed the 1st Guards Rifle Division for combat feats, efficient organisation and military skill in fighting against the Nazi invaders. The 127th Rifle Division, commanded by Colonel A.Z. Akimenko, the 153rd Rifle Division, commanded by Major General N.A. Gargan, and the 161st Rifle Division, commanded by Colonel P.F. Moskvitin, fought bravely for Yelnia. These divisions were renamed the 2nd, 3rd and 4th Guards Rifle Divisions, respectively. The Order of the People's Commissar for Defence, No. 308 of September 18, 1941, read, The 100th, 127th, 153rd and 161st Rifle Divisions have shown models of courage, daring and efficient organisation in numerous battles for our Soviet motherland against the Hitlerite hordes of Nazi Germany. Under the difficult combat conditions, these divisions repeatedly inflicted crushing defeats on the Nazi troops, forcing them to flee and instilling terror in them. Why were these rifle divisions able to defeat the enemy and drive back the vaunted German troops? First of all, in the offensive, they did not advance blindly, headlong, but only after careful reconnaissance, after serious preparations, after they had discovered enemy weak points and secured their flanks. Second, in breaching the enemy front, they did not only advance forward, but tried to widen the breach by operating in the nearest enemy rear, to the right and to the left of the breach. Third, capturing territory from the enemy, they consolidated the success by digging in at the new place, organising strong battle outposts for the night, and sending forward serious reconnaissance to probe the retreating enemy again. Fourth, taking up defensive positions, they effected not passive but active defence. They did not wait for the enemy to attack and drive them back, but counter-attacked themselves to discover enemy weak spots, improve their own positions, and at the same time steal their regiments in the course of counter-attacks to prepare them for the offensive. Fifth, when the enemy applied pressure, these divisions responded to enemy strikes with their own well-organised strikes. And last but not least, the commanders and the commissars in these divisions behaved bravely and were exacting, knowing how to make their subordinates carry out orders and not fearing to punish those who disobeyed orders and violated discipline. Subsequently, a numerous contingent of Soviet guards arose in the Red Army emulating the first guards' divisions. These were fundamentally new, truly people's guards. They embodied the best national traditions of all our peoples. Many internationalist fighters served under the banner of the Soviet guards, Spaniard Ruben Ibaruri, Dolores Ibaruri's son, Czech Otakard Yaros and others. Units of the 107th Rifle Division, commanded by Colonel P. V. Mironov, fought heroically at Yelnia. 
the division had been awarded a challenge red banner in peacetime for successes in military and political training. That high award was shown to have been fully deserved on the battlefield. The men destroyed up to five regiments of Nazi infantry, including the Regiment Führer of the SS Reich Division. I personally witnessed the fierce battle waged by this division's 586th Rifle Regiment, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel I. M. Nekrasov from the commander's observation post. The regiment took the village of Voloskovo by storm, but found itself surrounded all of a sudden. Despite a concussion suffered in the fighting, Lieutenant Colonel Nekrasov continued to command the fighting, which lasted for three days. Supported by the other units of the 107th Division, the artillery and aviation, the regiment not only broke out of encirclement, but also smashed the enemy, capturing an important strong point, the railway station, in the process. Particular skill was shown by the regiment's battalion commanded by N.D. Kozin, now Major General. I also observed his excellent tactical abilities and personal courage later in fighting at Belgorod and in Berlin. The number of such examples of real heroism and valour in those days could be multiplied indefinitely. Taking advantage of darkness and the fact that the bottleneck had not been closed yet, the surviving enemy troops retreated from the Yelnya area, leaving many dead and wounded, smashed panzers and heavy weapons on the battlefield. During the fighting in the Yelnya area, up to five divisions had been routed. The enemy lost 45,000, 47,000 killed and wounded. The enemy paid a high price for the attempt to hold on to the Yelnya salient. Our troops entered Yelnya in the morning on September 6th. Soon, residents hiding from the Nazis appeared in the city. I gave a short report to Stalin on the course of the fighting and overall results of the Yelnya operation. I described the actions of the brave units, formations and their commanders, and the losses of the Nazi troops. According to POWs, some units had no mortars or artillery left at all. The enemy had lately committed panzers and aviation only in individual groups, and only to repulse our attacks on the most important sectors. Apparently, they had transferred these forces to other sectors. Our artillery operated very well, even in the newly formed divisions. The rocket artillery devastated everything. I examined the places which had been attacked by rockets and saw that the defence facilities had been razed to the ground. The main enemy defensive stronghold, Ushakovo, had been completely destroyed as a result of rocket volleys, and the dugouts were ploughed under. On September 7th, pursuing the enemy, our units reached the Stryana River, forced it, and were assigned to follow up the offensive in cooperation with a group of troops of the Western Front under General P. P. Sobenikov. The defeat of the enemy Yelnya group in the course of the successful operation heightened the morale among the troops and strengthened their faith in victory. The units countered enemy attacks more resolutely, fought the enemy with fire, and counterattacked with unanimous effort. Although we failed to complete the encirclement of the enemy and take the Yelnya group prisoner, we did not have sufficient forces then, particularly tanks, on September 8th the situation was in our favour. The dangerous enemy Yelnya salient on the left flank of the 24th Army had been eliminated. Not everywhere did events develop smoothly. I would like to describe one unfortunate occurrence. Having been assigned to capture a bridgehead on the western bank of the Striana River, a rifle division of the 43rd Army did not secure its left flank after forcing the river and moved quickly ahead without sufficient reconnaissance. Having failed to take the required measures to provide for combat security, the young and insufficiently experienced commander committed a serious mistake. The enemy immediately took advantage of that mistake. A tank counterattack disrupted the division's battle formation. The Soviet soldiers fought stubbornly, skillfully repelling enemy attacks and inflicting considerable losses on the enemy. The enemy panzer units sustained particularly telling losses due to our anti-tank and divisional artillery. It is difficult to say now which side suffered more losses. The Nazi counterattack was repulsed, but we were also compelled to halt the offensive on this sector. Such was the price of unconsidered action by the division commander. I was forced to remain with the commander on his observation post almost till night on September 9th to correct the mistakes that had been committed. 
a telephone message arrived unexpectedly from Shaposhnikov in the daytime. The Supreme Commander-in-Chief was summoning me to GHQ at 8pm. There was nothing more in the message, and it was difficult to understand the reason why I was being summoned. I had to go, but the situation required my presence here until order had been restored on the army's left flank. Certain other combat orders had to be issued to the army commander. In addition, Moscow was a long distance away. An estimate showed that I would be late for the appointed time. Stalin was extremely intolerant of late arrivals when he summoned anyone. But what could I do? The situation in war does not take into account the character traits of the commanders. It was necessary to decide correctly what was more important, to complete the mission on the field of battle or to arrive at the prescribed time to one senior commander on his call, overlooking the circumstances. I believe that a person who is incapable of solving such a problem correctly cannot claim to be a commander. After thinking for a short time, I sent the following telephone message to the Chief of General Staff. Report to the Supreme Commander-in-Chief that in view of the situation, I will arrive one hour late. I will not conceal the fact that all the way to Moscow, I wondered how to explain the situation on the left flank of the 24th Army in a more convincing way, so that Stalin would correctly understand the reason for my delay. I arrived in the Kremlin in pitch darkness. Suddenly, I was blinded by a flashlight. The car stopped. In the approaching officer, I recognised Chief of the Security Department, General Vlasic. We greeted each other. The Supreme Commander-in-Chief has ordered to meet you and take you to his flat. I came out of the car and followed the General. It was no use asking anything because I would not get the answers to the questions that interested me. As I climbed the stairway to the second story where Stalin's flat was, I had still not decided what I would say as an excuse for my delay. Entering the lunchroom where Stalin, VM Molotov, Ash Sherbakov and other Politburo members were seated around a table, I said, Comrade Stalin, I am an hour late in arriving. Dot Stalin looked at his watch and said, an hour and five minutes, and added, Sit down and have something to eat if you're hungry. The Supreme Commander-in-Chief was examining the map of the situation at Leningrad. Those who were present sat in silence. I did not have anything to eat, and also remained silent. Finally, Stalin broke away from the map, and addressing me, said, We have discussed the situation with Leningrad once again. The enemy has taken Schlüsselburg and bombed the Badaev food stores on September 8th. Large supplies of food have perished. We have no communications with Leningrad by land. The population is in a difficult situation. The Finnish troops are advancing from the north on the Karelian Isthmus, while the Nazi troops of Army Group North, reinforced by the 4th Panzer Group, are driving towards the city from the south. The Supreme Commander fell silent and turned to the map again. One of the State Defence Committee members remarked, We have reported to Comrade Stalin that the command of the Leningrad Front would hardly be able to straighten out the situation. Stalin eyed the person who had spoken with reproach, but remained silent, examining the map again. Suddenly he asked, Comrade Zhukov, how do you appraise the situation on the Moscow sector? I understood him and caught on to the thought linking together the situation on different fronts, but did not answer right away. I believe that the Germans must replenish their units considerably at the present time. According to prisoners from Army Group Centre, the enemy has suffered heavy losses. In some units, they reach 50%. Besides, without completing the operation at Leningrad and linking up with the Finnish troops, the Germans would hardly begin an offensive on the Moscow sector. However, this is my personal opinion. The Hitlerite command may have different plans and intentions. In any case, we must always be ready for steadfast defensive actions on the Moscow sector. Stalin nodded, satisfied, then asked abruptly, Now, how did the units of the 24th Army operate? They fought well, Comrade Stalin, I answered particularly the 100th, 127th, 153rd and 161st Rifle Divisions. How do you explain the success scored by these divisions, Comrade Zhukov, and what is your opinion of the abilities of the Army's command and political personnel? I told him what I thought. 
Stalin listened attentively for about fifteen minutes and made short notes in a pad. Then he said, Well done. This is just what we need at this point. Then he suddenly added, You will have to fly to Leningrad and take over command of the front and the Baltic fleet from Voroshilov. The proposal was completely unexpected for me. Nevertheless, I said that I was ready to carry out the mission. Very well, said Stalin. You must be aware, he continued, that in Leningrad you will have to fly over the front line or over Lake Ladoga, which is controlled by the German Air Force. Then the Supreme Commander took a pad from the table and wrote something in bold handwriting. Folding the paper, he handed it to me. Present this note to Comrade Voroshilov personally. The note read, Turn over command of the front to Zhukov and immediately fly to Moscow. Stalin added, The Supreme Command order on your appointment will be issued when you arrive in Leningrad. I realised that these words reflected concern that our flight might end badly. Before leaving, I asked the Supreme Commander-in-Chief to permit me to take along two or three generals who would be useful on the spot. Take anyone you want, answered Stalin. Then, remaining silent for a while, he said, Things are going badly in the southwestern direction. We have decided to replace the Commander-in-Chief there. Whom do you think we should send there? Lately, Marshal Timoshenko has had extensive practice in organising combat operations, and he knows the Ukraine very well. I advise you to send him, I answered. You're probably right. And whom will we appoint to command the Western Front instead of Timoshenko? Commander of the 19th Army, Lieutenant General Konev. Stalin consented to this too. He telephoned Shaposhnikov right away and instructed him to summon Marshal Timoshenko and transmit the order to Konev on his appointment as commander of the Western Front. I was about to take my leave when Stalin asked, How do you appraise the enemy's further plans and potentialities? Thus I gained another opportunity to attract the particular attention of the Stavka to the dangerous situation in Ukraine. I said, At the present time, besides Leningrad, the most dangerous sector for us is the southwestern front. I believe that in the nearest days a difficult situation may arise there. Army Group Centre, which has reached the chernigov novgorod Seversky area, may run over the 21st Army and break into the rear of the southwestern front. I am certain that Army Group South, which has seized a bridgehead in the Kremenchug area, will coordinate its operations with Guderian's army. A serious threat hangs over the southwestern front. I recommend once again to immediately withdraw the Kiev group to the eastern bank of the Dnieper River and build up reserves somewhere in the Konotop area, consisting of troops from this group. And what about Kiev? However hard it may be, Comrade Stalin, Kiev must be abandoned. There is no other way out. Stalin removed the receiver and called Shaposhnikov. What are we going to do with the Kiev group? he asked. Zhukov insists that we immediately withdraw it. I did not hear what Shaposhnikov answered, but in conclusion Stalin told him, Timoshenko will be here tomorrow. Consider the question with him, and in the evening we'll talk it over with the front's military council. Such a talk between the Stavka and the Military Council of the Southwestern Front took place two days later, on September 11th. Here it is. Kiponos, Burmistenko and Tupikov are on the line. Stalin, Shaposhnikov and Timoshenko are here. Stalin. Your proposal to withdraw the troops beyond the river, you know, seems dangerous to me. In the given situation on the eastern bank of the Dnieper, the withdrawal of troops you propose would mean encirclement of our troops, because the enemy would advance against us not only from Konotop, that is from the north, but also from the south, that is from Kremenchug, and also from the west, since if our troops were to be withdrawn from the Dnieper, the enemy would instantly occupy the eastern bank of the Dnieper and would begin to attack. If the enemy Konotop group links up with the Kremenchug group, you will be surrounded. As you see, your proposals on the immediate withdrawal of the troops without preliminary preparation of the line along the Sile River, first of all, and second, without desperate attacks against the enemy Konotop group in cooperation with the Bryansk Front. I repeat, without these conditions, your proposals on withdrawal of troops are dangerous and may lead to a catastrophe. What is the way out? 
it can be the following. First, immediately regroup forces, if only by drawing on the Kiev fortified area and other troops, and launch desperate attacks against the enemy Konotop group in cooperation with Yeremenko, concentrating nine-tenths of the air force strength here. Yeremenko has already been issued relevant instructions. As to Petrov's air force group, we relocated it from Kharkov by a special order today, turning it over to the southwestern front. Second, immediately organize a defensive line along the Sile River or somewhere near that line, deploying a large artillery group facing north and west and withdrawing five, six divisions to that line. Third, after creating an assault force against the enemy Konotop group and after creating a defensive line on the Sile River, in other words, after all that is done, begin evacuation of Kiev. Prepare carefully to blow up the bridges, leave no boats or pontoons on the Dnieper and destroy them, and after evacuating Kiev, dig in on the eastern bank of the Dnieper, preventing the enemy from breaking through. Cease, after all, searching for new lines to retreat to, and search for ways to resist and only resist. Kirponos We had no intention of withdrawing the troops before we were asked to present our considerations on withdrawal of troops to the east with indicating relevant lines, but only requested that our front be reinforced with reserves in view of the fact that the front has extended to more than 800 kilometres. Two rifle divisions with artillery are being taken from Kostenko's army, in accordance with instructions from the Supreme Command received in the early hours of September 11th, and transferred by railway to the Konotop sector, with the aim of destroying, jointly with Podlas and Kuznetsov's armies, the enemy motorised group that has broken through towards Romney. In our opinion, no more troops should be taken from the Kiev fortified area, since two and a half rifle divisions have already been withdrawn from there for the Chernigov sector. Only some of the artillery may be taken from the Kiev fortified area. Supreme Command instructions just received by telegraph will immediately be implemented. That's all. Stalin. First, the proposals to withdraw the troops from the southwestern front originated from you and from Budeni, commander-in-chief of the southwestern direction. Here is an excerpt from his report. Shaposhnikov pointed out that the Supreme Command considers withdrawal of units of the southwestern front to the east premature. If the Supreme Command does not have the possibility to concentrate such a strong group at present, the withdrawal of the southwestern front is quite timely. As you see, Shaposhnikov is against the withdrawal of troops, while the commander-in-chief is for it, as was the southwestern front, which was for immediate troop withdrawal. Second. Keep us systematically informed concerning measures to organise an assault force against the enemy Konotop group and preparations of defences along the line, you know. Third, do not leave Kiev and do not blow up the bridges without permission from the Supreme Command. Bidding me farewell before my departure for Leningrad, the Supreme Commander-in-Chief said, We are relying on you. I dropped in to see Vasilevsky, who was the first Deputy Chief of General Staff at the time. He was working on problems of the southwestern direction. I asked Vasilevsky how he appraised the situation on this direction, and he said, I think the withdrawal of troops beyond the Dnieper is long overdue. Coming in to see Shaposhnikov, I arranged with him to communicate through remaining lines and by wireless, and asked his opinion on the existing situation and his prognosis for the nearest future. He gladly shared his thoughts. To this day, I recall Shaposhnikov and always feel great gratitude for the intelligent advice he invariably gave me. In regard to Leningrad, Shaposhnikov was optimistic. At this point I would like to interrupt the more or less consecutive account of the course of events. The first, extremely grim two and a half months of the war had passed. Our losses were very heavy. The Air Force of the Frontier Districts lost nearly 1,200 aircraft in the first day of the war. Supported by numerous aircraft, enemy armoured and motorised formations continued to move forward, driving wedges between our troops, attacking groups from the flanks, and destroying communication hubs and lines. Many thousands of Soviet soldiers and civilians were killed. At the same time, from the very outset, everything was developing not as was planned by the German High Command. 
it is yet to be analysed by historians how, consecutively, against the seemingly favourable victorious background, the Nazis' intentions were foiled one after another. All this had far-reaching consequences about which we will have occasion to set forth our opinion. What did the Nazi troops stumble upon when they made the first step on our country's territory? What prevented them from advancing at their usual rates above all? One can firmly say that it was the mass-scale heroism of our troops, their fierce resistance, steadfastness, and the ardent patriotism of both the armed forces and the people. History knows quite a few instances when troops rapidly lost their ability to resist and, abandoning excellent weapons, simply fled. No one can draw a clear line between the roles played by weapons, military hardware and the morale of the troops. However, there is no doubt that, other conditions being equal, the greatest battles and entire wars were won by troops showing an iron will for victory, awareness of purpose, tenacity and loyalty to the colours under which they fought. In this connection, I think it would be fitting to let the enemy we fought in the Great Patriotic War speak for themselves. Most of the sources I quote were written in the early days and not in subsequent years when political, propaganda and even personal interests could influence the authors. It should be taken into account that for several years before the invasion of the USSR, Nazi newspapers, radio and documents were naturally marked by a victorious tone. It is not so important on what front and under whose command the troops mentioned in the sources fought. The important thing is the general trend in appraising the situation and course of events, as well as the conduct of soldiers and officers during the period when we were suffering defeats and when it was incredibly difficult for us. Of course, a lot lay in store for us. The Soviet people realised that a long struggle lay ahead and that Nazi Germany would throw more and more forces onto the Eastern Front until they were completely exhausted. But the reader should see how the German victorious tone gradually began to abate at the first operational and tactical failures on the Eastern Front, replaced by surprise and disappointment. Let us see what our enemies say. Major General von Butler, War in Russia, an excerpt from the book 1939-1945. to World War. The Sixth Army was set the task of breaking through the Russian frontier defences south of Koval, thereby enabling the first panzer group to emerge into manoeuvring space. After certain initial successes, the troops of Army Group Centre came upon substantial enemy forces putting up defence at the pre-arranged positions, which in some places had even firing points reinforced with concrete. In defending these positions, the enemy committed large tank forces to battle and delivered a number of counter-attacks on the advancing German troops. After fierce battles that lasted several days, the Germans succeeded in breaking through the enemy's strong defences west of the lvov rava ruskaya line and in force crossing the Stier River, as well as pressing eastward against enemy troops, which put up tough resistance and repeatedly launched counter-attacks. Because of the stiff resistance of the Russians, the German troops, during the first days of war, suffered losses in manpower and materiel that were much heavier than those sustained in Poland and in the West. It became absolutely evident that the enemy's warfare methods and fighting spirit, as well as the country's geographic conditions, were absolutely different from those encountered by the Germans in the previous Blitzkriegs, which led to amazing success for the whole world. An excerpt from the service journal of Colonel General Halder, Chief of the General Staff of the German Ground Forces, June 26, 1941, Fifth Day of War. Evening summaries of operations for July 25th and morning summaries for July 26th report as follows. Army Group South is advancing slowly, unfortunately suffering considerable losses. The enemy acting against the Army Group South is reported to be directed with firmness and vigour. The enemy is constantly moving up fresh forces against our tank wedge. Reserves are pulling up before the central sector of the front, as was observed earlier, and before the southern flank of the group of armies. June 29, 1941, Eighth Day of War. Information from the front confirms that the Russians are generally fighting till the last man. Infantry General Ott reported his impressions about the battle in the Grodno area. 
The Russians' stiff resistance compels us to conduct war in keeping with all the rules of our combat regulations. Both in Poland and the West, we could afford certain liberties and deviations from the regulations. Now this is inadmissible. The impact of the enemy's aviation on our troops seems to be very weak. The evening situation. In the Lvov area, the enemy is slowly retreating eastward, putting up a tough fight for the last line. Here, for the first time, mass destruction of bridges by the enemy can be observed. July 4th, 1941, 13th day of war. In the course of our army's advance, all the enemy's attempts at resistance will, obviously, be broken soon. Then we shall be confronted with the question of seizing Leningrad and Moscow. It is to be seen how effective the statement by Stalin calling upon all the working people to join in the people's war against us will be. This will determine the measures and forces with which we shall have to mop up the vast industrial regions to be occupied by us. July 7th, 1941, 16th day of war. Army Group South. The optimism of the 11th Army Command has vanished again. The offensive of the 11th Army is being held up again. The causes are not clear. The 17th Army is successfully moving ahead, concentrating its vanguards for a blow in the direction of Proskurov. July 8th, 1941, 17th day of war. Army Group Centre. The second panzer group is, in part, fighting the continuously counter-attacking enemy in the direction of the Dnieper. Using its infantry and tanks, the enemy is especially fiercely counter-attacking in the Orsha direction against the northern flank of the second panzer group. The third panzer group, in some places, is force-crossing by its vanguards, the western Daugava, and is striving to break through in the direction of Vitebsk, repulsing the enemy's attacks from the north. The enemy is no longer capable of forming a continuous front, even in the key directions. At present, the Red Army Command apparently sets itself the task, by committing to battle all its available reserves, to wear out the German troops as much as possible through counter-attacks, and to check their offensive farther in the west. The formation of new enemy units, on a large scale in any case, will certainly fail because of the lack of commanding personnel, specialists and artillery materiel. At 12.30, a report at Führer's headquarters. First, the chief commander of the ground forces, Brauchich, G. Sir, reported on the latest developments at the front. Afterwards, I reported on the enemy's situation and gave an operational assessment of our troops' situation. In conclusion, there was discussion of questions that were raised. Results. 1. Führer considers the following the most desirable, ideal solution. Army Group Centre is, by a two-sided envelopment, to encircle and liquidate the enemy's grouping operating in front of it, and by breaking down the last organised resistance of the enemy at his stretched-out front, to open up a path toward Moscow. After both panzer groups reach the regions indicated by him in the directives on strategic deployment, it will be possible temporarily to keep the Hoth Group, to subsequently use it for supporting Army Group North and for a further offensive eastward, and then for encircling and not attacking Moscow. Guderian's Panzer Group, after it reaches its place of destination, should be sent in the southern or southeastern direction, east of the Dnieper, to support the offensive of Army Group South. 2. Führer is firmly determined to level Moscow and Leningrad with the earth, to fully dispose of their populations, which otherwise we shall have to feed during the winter. July 11, 1941, 20th day of war. Army Group North, Hepner's Panzer Group has been repulsing the enemy's attacks and preparing for a further offensive by the strong right flank into the area southeast of Leningrad. Colonel Oxner reported on his trip to the Panzer Groups of Guderian and Goth. The following should be noted. A. Russian aviation raids on crossing points across the western Daugava, southwest of Vitebsk. B. The enemy command is acting ably. The enemy is putting up a fierce and fanatic fight. C. The tank units have suffered substantial losses in manpower and materiel. The troops are tired. July 1941. The scope, strain and heat of fighting are increasing at the huge Soviet-German front with every day. 
Halder was compelled to admit that the Soviet troops' surprisingly tough resistance prevented the Nazi command from attaining the main goal of Plan Barbarossa, to encircle and destroy, in a lightning campaign, the main forces of the Red Army west of the Dnieper line, and not allow them to retreat into the country's rear. On July 26, 1941, Halder wrote, Report at Führer's on the operational plans of the groups of armies. From 18 o'clock to 2015, lengthy, at times excited debates on the lost opportunity of encircling the enemy. On July 30th, the chief of the German general staff notes in his diary that the High Command issued a new directive on further operations on the Eastern Front. To pass to the defence at the central sector of the front. Thus, as a result of the Red Army's stubborn resistance, Signs of uncertainty and nervousness appeared among many of Nazi Germany's military leaders, even at the top echelons. On the 29th day of the war, Halder writes, The fierce nature of the battles being waged by our mobile units operating in separate groups, and the weariness of the troops, which, ever since the beginning of the war, have repeatedly been on lengthy marches and have waged fierce and bloody battles, all caused despondency in the top echelons, this is especially reflected in the state of depression of the ground forces commander-in-chief. Towards the end of July, the Nazi army failed to achieve decisive successes. As early as July 18, 1941, Hulder wrote, The operation of Army Group South is getting less and less effective. The sector of the front before Korosten still requires sizable forces to retain it. The arrival of the enemy's large fresh forces in the Kiev area from the north compels us to move up infantry divisions there to ease the situation of the tank units of the 3rd Motorized Corps and later to replace them. As a result, at the northern sector of the front, many more forces than desired appear to be contained. The progress of Army Group North was even less gratifying to Holder. There is again extensive alarm over Army Group North, which has no main attack force and keeps making mistakes, he writes on July 22nd. Indeed, at the front of Army Group North, things are not always going smoothly compared with the other sectors of the Eastern Front. Differences arose at the Wehrmacht top echelon regarding objectives of further operations and directions where the main attacks were to be launched. Inconsistencies were observed in immediate missions assigned to troops. Thus, whereas on July 26th, Hitler demanded that the enemy's Gomel group be liquidated through an attack by the newly formed von Kluger group. On July 30th, Jodl informed Halder of another decision of the high command of the Wehrmacht. July 11th, 1941, 20th day of war. Army Group North. Hepner's Panzer Group has been repulsing the enemy's attacks and preparing for a further offensive by the strong right flank into the area southeast of Leningrad. Colonel Oxner reported on his trip to the panzer groups of Guderian and Goth. The following should be noted. A. Russian aviation raids on crossing points across the western Daugava, southwest of Vitebsk. B. The enemy command is acting ably. The enemy is putting up a fierce and fanatic fight. C. The tank units have suffered substantial losses in manpower and materiel. The troops are tired. Differences arose at the Wehrmacht top echelon regarding objectives of further operations and directions where the main attacks were to be launched. Inconsistencies were observed in immediate missions assigned to troops. Thus, whereas on July 26, Hitler demanded that the enemy's Gomel group be liquidated through an attack by the newly formed von Kluger group, on July 30th, Jodl informed Halder of another decision of the high command of the Wehrmacht. There should be no offensive on Gomel for the time being. This frenzy in actions was a result of unexpectedly stiff resistance by the Red Army. It can be seen from Hulder's diary that the German troops had suffered heavy losses in the first weeks of the fighting on the Soviet-German front. Here are a few examples. On July 20th, 1941, the general staff of the ground forces reported to the top leadership the combatant composition of the panzer units, the 16th Panzer Division has only 40% of the prescribed strength, the 11th Panzer Division, about 40%. The state of the 13th and 14th Panzer Divisions is no better. There follows a list of other units in approximately the same state. 
Here is an excerpt from J.F.C. Fuller's The Second World War, 1939-45, where he quotes revealing passages from the Nazi press. Already on the 29th of June, there appeared an article in Volkischer Beobachter pointing out that the Russian soldier surpasses our adversary in the West in his contempt for death. Endurance and fatalism make him hold out until he is blown up with his trench or falls in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. On the 6th of July, a somewhat similar article appeared in the Frankfurter Zeitung, stating that the mental paralysis, which usually follows after the German lightning breakthroughs in the West, did not occur to the same extent in the East. In most cases, the enemy did not lose his capacity for action, but tried in his turn to envelop the arms of the German pincers. This was something new in the tactics of the war. In fact, for the Germans, a surprising novelty. According to Arvid Fredberg, the author of the article, Ed, the German soldier had met an enemy who, with fanatical toughness, stuck to his political creed, and who, against the German blitz attack, put up total resistance. Soon it became apparent that the Russians had not deployed the whole of their armies on the frontier, as the Germans expected they would do. It was also discovered that they themselves had profoundly misjudged the strength of the Russian reserves. Hitherto, German intelligence had largely relied on the fifth column assistance. In Russia, though there were discontented people, there was no fifth column. Such was the reality encountered by the German command in the first months of the fighting on the Soviet-German front. Obviously, it was not the reality the Hitlerite leadership had counted on. This thought clearly stands out in the excerpts quoted above. Here are the facts. In only the first two months of the war in the USSR, the Wehrmacht ground forces lost about 400,000 officers and men. It is notable that from June to December 1941, the Nazi invaders lost a mere 9,000 men outside the Soviet-German front. Enemy losses at the end of the summer-autumn campaign comprised slightly less than 800,000 officers and men from the best crack units. And all this developed under the extremely unfavourable conditions which emerged for us at the beginning of the war. The enemy had much more combat experience since he had already been fighting for a long period. The initiative was also in his hands. The enemy exceeded us in the number of troops and military equipment in the main directions, since he had been preparing for war for a long time and had rapidly modernised and mechanised the army of aggression for a number of years. The economy and resources for the first blow were also much more powerful because the enemy had almost the entire military potential of Europe in his hands. It should also be taken into account that when launching its military machine, the Nazi leadership had not used up all the resources it had prepared to seize Europe. Powerful reserves had been released and were all flung against the USSR. Of course, and we have mentioned this earlier, a severe struggle still lay ahead. We had to repeatedly strain all our forces to repulse the enemy onslaught, capture the initiative, do away with his temporary advantages, and take the upper hand in all respects to drive him from our country and then help Europe's nations overthrow the fascist yoke. However, a historic role was played in this great struggle by the heroic resistance the Soviet troops put up against superior enemy forces in the first months of the war, and above all the fierce fighting in the area of Peremyshal, Smolensk, Yelnya, and on the distant and immediate approaches to Kiev. In these battles, the Hitlerite command failed to realise its plans and calculations concerning the actual course of military events. The main thing was, however, that fascist economy, ideology, propaganda and politics, all its monstrous social system, faced problems that Nazi Germany was unable to solve in the course of the entire war against the Soviet Union. On September 10, 1941, by decision of the State Defence Committee, I was to fly to Leningrad. Before departing, I wrote down in my notebook, I learned a lot of useful things for command activities of the operational and strategic scale and for understanding different ways of carrying out operations during the organisation and successful outcome of the operation to eliminate the Yelnya salient and the comprehensive and complex work as chief of the general staff in the first five weeks of the war. Now I have a much better idea of what the commander must master in order to successfully carry out the duties placed upon him. 
It is my profound conviction that in the struggle the winner is the one who has trained his troops better in the political and moral respect, who has succeeded in explaining the aims of the war and the aims of the coming operation to the troops more clearly, and in raising their combat spirit, who strives for military valour, is not afraid of fighting under unfavourable circumstances, and who believes in his subordinates. Perhaps the most important condition for success in battle or in an operation is to discover timely the weak spots of the enemy troops and command. Interrogations of prisoners showed that the German command and troops were operating according to a set pattern, without creative initiative, only blindly following orders. That is why, as soon as the situation changed, the Germans became confused, acted very passively, and waited for orders from the higher commander, which could not always be obtained timely in the existing combat situation. Observing the course of engagement and troop actions personally, I saw that where our troops did not merely resist, but, at the first opportunity, counter-attacked the enemy by day and by night, they were almost always successful, particularly at night. The Germans acted with extreme uncertainty at night, I would even say, badly. From the practice of the first operations, I concluded that those commanders failed most often who did not visit the terrain where the action was to take place themselves, but only studied it on the map and issued written orders. The commanders who are to carry out combat missions must by all means know the terrain and enemy battle formations very well in order to take advantage of weak points in his disposition and direct the main blow there. Hastily adopted decisions without a detailed rechecking of the information obtained and due account for the individual qualities of those who report the situation, their military knowledge, experience, endurance and composure, have a particularly negative effect on the course of the operation or battle. To achieve victory on any scale, it is important to secure cooperation between all arms of the service both in operational elements and in tactical formations on the terrain, or at least on the sand table. The morning of September 10th, 1941, was cool and overcast. At Moscow's central airfield, where I had come to board a plane for beleaguered Leningrad, three figures loomed beside the plane on the takeoff strip, one tall, that of Lieutenant General M. S. Kozin, the second, a little shorter, that of Major General Second Fedyuninsky, and the third, that of the flyer who would pilot our aircraft. The two generals, as I had arranged with Stalin, would fly with me. The pilot reported that his crew and plane were ready for takeoff. As most people do in such cases, all of us involuntarily raised our eyes to the sky, trying to guess what the weather would be during our flight. The clouds hung dense and low. We'll slip by, the pilot said, smiling. The weather couldn't be better for crossing the enemy lines. We took off without delay. Leningrad was our destination, and we were already there in our thoughts. None of us, of course, could have foretold then that the city we were flying to would put up a fight of unexampled heroism, resisting the enemy and hunger for nine hundred days and nights. Leningrad is the cradle of the proletarian revolution. It evokes warm feelings in the hearts of all Soviet people. Here Lenin had led our party, laying the foundation of the world's first socialist state. From the first days of Soviet government, the city had played an exceedingly important part in our country's political, economic and cultural development. Leningrad is a city of untold beauty. Its architectural masterpieces, the paintings and sculptures collected there, the magnificent monuments, the alluring gardens, parks and museums are the pride of our country. The Nazi command attached exceptional importance to capturing this large industrial centre and seaport. Its seizure would have given Nazi Germany a number of political, economic and moral advantages. From the political and strategic point of view, capturing Leningrad and making direct contact with the Finnish troops would tighten the fascist coalition and prompt the governments of certain other, still hesitant countries, to go to war against the Soviet Union. Swift seizure of Lenin. Rad was the German command's next major objective after Smolensk. Since the very beginning of the war, it had been very evident that the enemy aimed for Leningrad, and the Red Army Command had paid close attention to reinforcing the city's defence. According to the report I received from Leningrad, the situation was complicated. 
In the south, the enemy was able to bring into action up to 20 infantry divisions, which had crossed the Neva River and pressed forward toward the city. The enemy's air force was also taking an active part in the offensive against Leningrad, systematically bombarding and destroying military and civilian facilities and instilling panic among the population. My discussions with Generals Kozin and Fedyuninsky on the flight to Leningrad revolved around two fundamental issues, the conduct of operations and the issue of the food supply to the city. We were well aware that the Germans had a clear advantage over us both in manpower and equipment. The air situation was also unfavourable for our troops. I was intent on persuading them to use their experiences in Leningrad to the fullest extent for the success of the forthcoming operations. At the gates to the Smolny, we were stopped by the guard, who ordered us to show our passes. None of us had any, of course, and I identified myself. But that did not help. Orders are orders in the army, and no one was to pass without authority. You'll have to wait a little, comrade general, the guard said to me, and called for the duty officer. We had to wait for nearly fifteen minutes until the commandant issued a personal permit for us. At the entrance to the Smolny, we were met by an aide of the front commander. Where is comrade Voroshilov? I asked. The aide said he was presiding at a conference of the Front's military council, attended by some of the commanders of armies and chiefs of arms of the service, as well as the commander of the Baltic fleet and directors of important city enterprises. We went up a flight of stairs to the Front commander's room, and on entering it saw about a dozen people seated around a red cloth-covered table. I asked Voroshilov and Shtanov for permission to attend, and a short while later handed Voroshilov a note from Stalin. Not without trepidation, I must confess. The marshal read the note in silence, nodded his head, gave the note to Zhdanov, and got on with the conference. The front's military council was discussing what to do if the city could no longer be held. People made curt, dry statements. The key military and industrial targets, and so on, were to be destroyed. Today, more than thirty years later, all this sounds incredible. But at that time the situation was critical, though a few reserves were still untapped. Discussion ended with a unanimous expression of resolve to defend Leningrad to the last drop of blood. At that moment, probably, everyone attending the conference felt most acutely the full burden of his responsibility to the party and the people. All of us were determined to fulfil the mission set for us by the Politburo of the party's Central Committee and the State Defence Committee. I was greatly pleased to discover that I knew many of the commanders, party and political workers, and Baltic fleet officers. I had a good idea of what I could expect from each of them, and what jobs each could be trusted with. And it was a special pleasure to know that the party's Central Committee Secretary, Andrei Zhdanov, a magnificent organiser, and a charming and warm-hearted man, who was revered by Leningraders and the troops, stood at the head of the Leningrad Party Organisation, and was a member of the Front's military council. Towards nightfall on September 10th, by authority of the Supreme Commander's note and without posting the official order, I took command of the Leningrad Front. Until the morning hours of September 11th, we discussed the situation and what additional measures could be taken to protect Leningrad. Taking part in the discussion were Zhdanov, Voroshilov, Admiral Izakov, the Front's Chief of Staff, and the chiefs of some arms of the service. I knew the city and its environs because I had studied there some years before at Cavalry Commander's improvement courses. Much had changed since then, of course, but I still had a good idea of the battle zone. On the day of our arrival, the situation became tenser still. The Nazi attacks on points defended by the 42nd Army were especially ferocious. Enemy panzers broke through into Uritsk, but our anti-tank artillery made them turn back. With panzer, air and artillery support, and despite heavy losses, the German infantry was persistently attacking the Pulkovo Heights and the towns of Pushkin and Kolpino. In the ferocious fighting, the 42nd Army commander used up all his reserves. The badly depleted 55th Army under General I.G. Lazarev was manning the southeastern approaches to Leningrad. Quite obviously, it lacked the requisite strength. At Kolpino, the battle lines ran close to the Azorsky plant, which was filling an important military order. 
Responding to the appeal of the plant's party branch, its communists and komsomols took up arms and formed a workers' battalion. The Nazi attempts to crash into the city at this point were flung back. The Azorsky plant people stood their ground unto death. I learned of the acute shortage of anti-tank guns all along the front. We decided to make up for it by using anti-aircraft guns that could pierce armour. Some of the anti-aircraft guns were immediately removed from the city squares and streets and stationed at the most dangerous points. The front's military council ordered the construction of a deeply echeloned and ramified defence line at the most vulnerable sectors. It had all the approaches to the city densely mined and some of the obstacles charged with electricity. The area around the Pulkovo Heights called for special attention. The first thing to do was to buttress the pulkovo uritsk line of defence. Part of the 23rd Army, stationed on the Karelian Isthmus where the Finns had been halted, was rushed in to assist the 42nd Army. In addition to front artillery, Baltic Fleet Ordnance also concentrated its fire on this sector. We also planned to form five or six separate rifle brigades of Baltic Fleet seamen and Leningrad students. They were to be activated in five or six days. Fulfilment of all these measures was to begin in the morning of September 11th, which had already dawned. In addition to Zhdanov, Kuznetsov and me, the military council included T.F. Shtikov, secretary of the Leningrad Regional Party Committee, N.V. Solovyov, chairman of the Regional Executive Committee, and P.E. Popkov, chairman of the City Executive Committee. We laboured through the night with vigour and imagination as a close-knit team. None of the enumerated comrades, I'm sorry to say, is alive. But I want everyone to know that they were fine men, dedicated party men and statesmen. They did everything that could be done to defend Leningrad, which was in mortal danger. Leningraders knew them well and respected them for their stout courage and willpower. The people of the city, each at his or her post, did their duty with courage beyond compare. The main task was to supply the troops with arms, ammunition and other military equipment. They were manufactured under continuous enemy shelling and ceaseless air raids. The Kirov plant, which made the heavy KV tanks, plant director I. M. Zaltzman, was turned into a major centre of defence. Many of its workers had joined the Opolchenia, the People's Volunteer Army. Their places were taken by boys and girls, women and old men. The bulk of the workforce took up lodgings in the plant's office building and other factory premises. People did not leave the plant grounds for days on end. The windows of shops facing the front had to be shuttered with armour plating and sandbags owing to the proximity of the battle lines. Production did not stop during air raids and shellings. The off-duty shift put out fires caused by incendiary bombs and the medical staff treated the wounded. The Nazis had a painstakingly drawn-up scheme for shelling and bombing the key targets – factories, educational establishments, railway stations, hospitals and shopping centres. Streets with the liveliest traffic were favourite Nazi targets. Prisoner of war, Launo Rudolf of the 240th Artillery Regiment, 170th Infantry Division, testified later that Leningrad was shelled in the morning from 8 to 9, then from 11 to 12, in the afternoon from 5 to 6, and in the evening from 8 to 10, and that the shelling was meant to kill the city's inhabitants, destroy factories and other vital buildings, and affect the Leningraders' morale. The Nazis stuck at nothing. In the Schlüsselburg area, where the 1st Rifle Division of NKVD troops under Colonel S.I. Donskov was holding the line, enemy units attempted to cross the Neva at the Poroshnevskaya dubrovka moskovskaya dubrovka sector. On orders of the Nazi command, Soviet women, children and old men herded in from nearby villages were made to march in front of the German troops. To avoid hitting their countrymen, our gunners had to display a high degree of accuracy. The enemy was straining every muscle to capture the city. At dawn on September 11th, the Nazis renewed their offensive, with German shock troops mounting massive assaults against our lines. Towards the end of the day, they managed to take Dudahov. The following day, we were compelled to abandon Krasnoya Selo under pressure of superior forces. Our troops defending the towns of Pushkin and Slutsk were in desperate straits too. General Halder, 
Chief of General Staff of Nazi Germany's ground forces, put the following down in his diary. The offensive on Leningrad of the 41st Motorized and 38th Army Corps is developing quite satisfactorily. A great achievement. Fierce and costly battles continued for nearly a week. Halder made this other entry in his diary. In the sector of Army Group North considerable successes are recorded in the offensive on Leningrad. The enemy has begun to weaken in the zone of Reinhardt's 41st Motorized G. Zer Corps. Getic and resolute action was called for. It was essential that we should use the least opportunity to counter-attack day or night, fatiguing the enemy, inflicting losses in men and arms, and frustrating his offensive actions. The strictest order and discipline had to be maintained. Troop control had to be tightened. On September 11th, General Kozin was appointed Chief of Staff of the Leningrad Front, and on September 14th, the Front's Military Council appointed Fedyuninsky commander of the 42nd Army. The 168th Rifle Division under Colonel A.L. Bondarev had distinguished itself in the fighting for the towns of Pushkin and Slutsk. This regular division had fought heroically on the Finnish border and in the Karelian forests northwest of Lake Ladoga for 45 days. On orders of the command, fighting rearguard battles in the most difficult conditions, the division withdrew to Valum Island, whence it was transferred to the Leningrad area. Its men had managed to keep nearly all their equipment intact, including the howitzers and guns of its artillery regiments. Reinforced by Leningrad communists, the division came to grips with the enemy at Novolisino, Slutsk and the town of Pushkin, and fought just as tenaciously as it had on the Finnish border. The fighting around Kolpino was especially ferocious. We were working to stabilise the situation at Leningrad in a most complicated environment. The enemy kept increasing pressure, especially in the sector held by the 42nd Army at Pulkovo. The other sectors, at Schlüsselburg and Oranienbaum, also required close attention. Though there the attacks were secondary, we could not leave them without notice because a Nazi advance would entail serious complications. With deep gratitude, I want to mention the intelligent organisational role of Colonel General A. A. Novikov, commander of Leningrad's Air Force, who used the fronts and Navy aircraft most effectively to help drive back the raging enemy. Admiral Izakov was my deputy for naval affairs. I am deeply convinced that he was one of the most intelligent and gifted Soviet naval leaders. Under his guidance, the Baltic fleet activated six separate marine brigades and turned them over to the Leningrad front. Together with General V.P. Sviridov, chief of the front's artillery, he lost no time in pooling front and navy resources, launching a powerful long-range counter-artillery group. Hitler called on Field Marshal von Lieb to get on with capturing Leningrad. He wanted the mobile units of the 4th Panzer Group to be released for use with Army Group Center in the Moscow sector. In the early morning of September 13th, two infantry, one Panzer and one motorized enemy division mounted an offensive in the general direction of Uritsk. They crashed through our defenses, captured Konstantinovka, Sosnovka and Finskoye Koirovo and rolled on towards Uritsk. A considerable development of the wedge from the west towards Leningrad, Halder put down jubilantly in his diary that day, and added in the evening, Considerable successes at Leningrad. The emergence of our troops at the internal fortified perimeter may be considered complete. A desperate situation had arisen. To eliminate the danger, the Front's military council decided to commit our last reserve, the 10th Rifle Division. This was a tremendous risk, but we had no other choice. In the morning of September 14th, after a brief but powerful preparatory artillery bombardment, the 10th Rifle Division and units of neighbouring formations, with air support, struck a swift blow at the enemy. Our original defence line was restored. Suffering heavy losses, the enemy withdrew from Sosnovka and Finskoya Koyerovo. We did our best, above all, to determine the enemy's potential strength grasp the designs of the Nazi command and identify the strong and weak points of the German troops blockading the city. We had to decide what forces and resources to commit against the enemy and what mode of action to adopt to thwart his intention of capturing Leningrad. Reflecting on how best to defend Leningrad, 
We noted that when attacking, the enemy sent troops into battle on a broad front in three groups, with the main force, panzers and infantry, coming from the south. Von Lieb was evidently convinced that this was where he would succeed in breaking into the city. However, due to the many houses crowded in the suburbs and the mass of forests, he advanced along the roads. We felt this was something we could profit from. We could cover all roads with artillery and mortar fire, hit them from the air, and put up man-made obstacles. Past experience had shown that the enemy was highly sensitive to all activity on our part. Counter-offensives and counter-attacks slowed him down. Instead of massing all shock troops in the main sector, he often confined himself to half-measures. This enabled us to win time, the time we needed to organise an effective counter-manoeuvre. The disposition of our troops made our defensive actions effectively dynamic. The Eighth Army was digging in at Oranienbaum. Given adequate support from the Navy and the 42nd Army, it could hit the enemy's western flank and rear, thus pinning down a considerable force that would otherwise have thrust toward the city. Much could also be expected of the 54th Army under Marshal G. I. Kulik. Stationed on the eastern flank of the narrow schlusselberg mungar corridor, it could mount an attack on enemy formations and thereby ease the situation of the Leningrad front by drawing off part of Army Group North from the main Pulkovo sector. It was clear that success depended on how actively our troops would operate in the main sectors. We had realised this the moment we arrived in Leningrad and reported accordingly to the Supreme Command. Our additional measures to buttress the city's defences included improving party political work with the troops and population to tighten discipline and instil faith in victory, continuing to inflict maximum losses on enemy shock troops by all available means, preventing them from breaching our defences, activating and fully arming another five rifle brigades and two rifle divisions by September 18th, with the bulk placed at the disposal of the 42nd Army to form its fourth line of defence. The 8th Army continuing to hit the enemy in the flank and rear to draw enemy forces away from Leningrad. Coordinating the actions of units of the front with those of the 54th Army to clear the Munger Schlüsselberg area of the enemy. Assigning more effective missions to underground party organisations and partisan detachments operating south of Leningrad. Two important factors were thus addressed, instilling unshakable confidence in our victory among the troops and inhabitants, and marshalling reserves to increase the depth of our defences. A sudden strike by the 8th Army was expected to yield immediate results. Special attention was also focused on the 42nd Army, as it was manning the most dangerous sector. We planned to build up defences there and thwart possible enemy attempts at seizing the city in a head-on attack. Much depended on the Navy and the coast artillery, which became increasingly relevant as the battlefield moved closer to the seashore. Later events showed that our plan was effective. A general idea of the situation in and around Leningrad and the measures we were taking to organise defences may be obtained from my telegraphic conversation with Shaposhnikov on September 14, 1941. Shaposhnikov, Greetings, Georgi Konstantinovich. Please report on the situation and tell me what measures you are taking.